I'm telling you, prophecy is exciting. Yes, it is. When you read in here what God said, and then you see it happening out here, then you know that Jehovah's God of the truth. I know my God has made the way for me. I know my God has made the way for me. Today on the Believer's Voice of Victory, Gloria Copeland and special guest Billy Brim discuss more of the signs of Jesus coming understand more about Bible prophecy and see how history has proven it to be true. Hello everybody, I'm Gloria Copeland. We have a special guest today, Billy Brim from Prayer Mountain in the Ozarks and she is telling us the Word of God. The Word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we're talking about the things that are happening around yeah. us and, and God bringing His Word to pass because He prophesied, it's prophecy, that He'll bring the Jews home and that'll be a sign to everyone that He's about to come Yay. and set up His earthly kingdom. And uh, we've looked at history and we've looked at the dark ages and you'd almost think that sometimes God couldn't get the job done. But praise the Lord, the light shined, the Puritans read the Bible, they discovered God wasn't through with Israel, and then they came over here and founded America. And you're going to have a meeting in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I did a meeting last, uh, uh, in 2010, in September, I, I, I crossed Canada. And I was teaching about the Puritans and how America was started and how they had seen in the Word of God that God wasn't through with the Jews and that when the Bible says Israel, it means Israel. And when it says Jerusalem, it means Jerusalem. They came to the United States, founded the United States. And uh, there uh, eventually, of course, the preachers came, George Whitfield and others. First, they were just colonies. And then he came preaching one nation under God. And then there was the Revolutionary War. And the only one instance... <clears throat> that the uh, revolutionary soldiers under Washington got expansionist. In other words, they tried to take some territory outside of the 13 colonies. They headed up toward Canada. And Benedict Arnold was the one that persuaded him to do that. And you know what happened to Benedict Arnold. He became a traitor. But they went up and they tried to take Canada and everything horrible went wrong with them. The swamps, the cold, the this, the that. They came running back down to the colonies with their tails between their legs. Hmm. And uh, I didn't bring this to read to you today, but you can go online and find it. It has to do with the prophecies concerning Canada, and it's called the Puritan Prophecy. And the Puritans, who were, they were breaking away from uh, England. And some of the people in the United States were loyalist to England. And they ran off up to Canada. And the Puritans and, and the people, the colonists, they felt bad about that. But a word of the Lord came to them and said, I have plans for this America, but don't feel badly about them. I have plans in the last days for Canada. Leave them alone. Wow. So you might want to go online, you Canadians. And yes, these things are happening now. The nations right now are being judged, Gloria. It's the judgment of the nation's time. Nations as nations are going to go no judgment. They're going to know the same judgment that Egypt knew. And we're going to talk about Egypt and its present day situation Monday. Oh, don't miss that. But it, Egypt was judged in the time of the Pharaohs. They knew the 10 plagues, the death of the firstborn, based on how they treated Israel. And every nation, even on my website, billybrim.org, I have all the scriptures listed where the nations are going to know judgment because of how they treated Israel. Now, wow. uh, we, we, we have had some, uh, I got this off a Jewish site, um, jewishworldreview.com, and uh, Lincoln and the Jews. It's an article by Herb uh, Gedould. Throughout history, he writes, Jews have had great friends and mortal enemies as rulers in the countries in which they lived. Perhaps no American president has been a greater friend of the Jewish people than Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was the first American president to become officially involved in questions of Jewish equality 
when he urged Congress to change the chaplaincy laws to permit rabbis to become military well. chaplains. In January 1863, he revoked the only incident of official anti-Jewish discrimination when he countermanded Grant's infamous Order No. 11, which expelled Jews from northern Mississippi, Tennessee, and Kentucky. He repealed that law. Lincoln also appointed seven Jewish generals to the Union forces. What were the reasons for Lincoln's concern and kindly attitude towards the Jews? First and foremost was the fact that by the time of the Civil War, Jews had become a factor in American life. He recognized it. They had grown to 150,000 in a nation of 30 million. Uh, but with the increased Jewish population, the, the president, future president, knew Jews as, and, and Lincoln, knew Jews as admirable neighbors in the little towns where he grew up. Louis Salzenstein was a storekeeper and livestock trader in the town of Athens, Illinois, near New Salem, where Lincoln spent six years. When Lincoln was postmaster, he collected the mail from Old Salty's store, which served as the regional post office. He became good friends with Salzenstein, who was remembered by a town historian, quote, as doing more than any other man toward bettering the improvements and the mode of living in this section. And uh, Lincoln's most valued and personal friend prior to his presidency was Abraham Jonas, an English Jew who settled in Williamston, Kentucky, near Lincoln's birthplace, and then moved to Quincy, Illinois. Jonas and Lincoln became good friends and political allies. Jonas was among the first men to propose Lincoln as a Republican candidate for the presidency Isn't that in the 1860 election. Praise Thank God. you, Jonas. Yes, amen. Uh, our, our presidents who were great, George Washington uh, at his memorial in uh, Mount Vernon, they have his famous statement there that every, every son of Abraham is welcome to have his own fig tree and to sit under it. Of course, he Praise had a wonderful God. relationship with Haim Solomon, Haim Solomon who financed the American Revolution. And then... Uh, he was Jewish, of He course. was Jewish, of course, yes. And then, of course, uh, Reagan. Reagan knew the Bible concerning Bible prophecy. Uh, we're at his 100th birthday year, and I just read a report in one of the major newspapers on his, his faith. And a lot of people don't know about it. he was deeply religious. Uh, his faith was, uh, was deep, and especially Bible prophecy. So, uh, and Harry Truman, he felt that he was in his place uh, to bless the Jews. Praise and uh, even Nixon whom, so, Nixon, whom some don't like, uh, he blessed the Jews. And it was because his mother, in a time when they needed a blessing. So thank God we've had some good leadership. Yes, and, we but have. we need more. We need leaders now who know the place of Israel and, know, and are not um, uh, replacement theology, but who believe that God is bringing them back and that we should bless Israel just like God said in Genesis. You bless Israel, you're blessed. You curse Israel, you're cursed. Now, Jesus, we've been talking about prophecy, Bible Just prophecy. Just give a, def a quick definition of a replacement theology. Replacement so theology, we went over watch. that in detail. I don't know if you archive these, do you? Uh, probably. Probably. But uh, when the dark ages came and uh, they, uh, the universal church at that time, third century, fourth century, they locked up the word of God because they began to teach that God was through with the Jews and that all the blessings of the Jews came over on the universal church. They locked up the word so mm -hmm. because it doesn't say that in the word. It says the Jews are coming home. So they locked up the word. And you only could have someone read it to you that could uh, allegorize it yeah. and show you. Uh, so they locked up the word and then they had to have statues because people couldn't, uh, couldn't have the word. So they had the statues and then they tried to make Jews be forced to be converted. And of course, they're not going to bow down to any graven images, you know. And oh, the wars were on, the, 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 the church, established church, the uh, Orthodox uh, in Russia, uh, they would take Jews and burn them in synagogues and drown them in rivers. You could, icy rivers, you could, you could either accept and be converted if you were a Jew or else you died. So it was a horrible, horrible time. But thank God his word is true yes, and he was is. able to bring them out. Now, primarily what ended that was the Reformation and uh, some of the reformers were the Puritans. And the Puritans, when they got the Word of God, they went to the Word of God, and they saw that that's not what they saw in their English church. 
And so they started, they wanted to change things to match the Bible. They got kicked out of England. They had to flee for their lives uh, to uh, Holland, and there they met Jews. Later on, they came to America. But uh, the Puritans found in the Bible that God still had a plan for Israel. And they began to write books about it. And in England, particularly, people in England started reading those books and getting excited. I'm telling you, prophecy is exciting. Yes, it is. When you read in here what God said, and then you see it happening out here, then you know that Jehovah's God of a truth. And so in England, there came to be people called Zionists, Christians. Herzl called them a new kind of Christian. These weren't Christians that said, we replace you and that we're going to burn you at the stakes under the sign of the cross. These were Christians that said, hey, God's going to bring you home. And uh, so in England, this particularly was uh, prolific. And there was a man, and his name is uh, Heckler, William Heckler. And he was a preacher. He was also very well a pastor. He was very well educated. And he began to be placed in some of the leading homes of Europe. Um, The Kaiser, Kaiser Willem, was really over uh, Germany. Well, he had an uncle who was uh, the Duke of Baden. And the Duke of Baden had two children that needed educating. So he hired Heckler, William Heckler, a Christian and a Zionist, to come and teach his children. So he came there. Uh, he's, he's going into the palaces of Europe. I don't know if you remember or not, but a lot of the kings and queens of Europe, the royalty, were related because Queen Victoria uh, had a prolific marriage, lots of children. And so her children and grandchildren, her progeny, were the heads of Europe. Uh, they were the heads of uh, mm-hmm. Kaiser Willem in Germany, the czars of Russia. Uh, they, they were all cousins, and they were related. So... Um, when he came to teach school or teach the, uh, the children of the Duke of Baden, he would give his lectures. Now, he got up at 4 o'clock every morning, this heckler, and he studied the word because it was so exciting to him that God was going to bring the Jews back home. He was one of us. And so he started making little clay models of Jerusalem, and he started making graphs, and he started counting the years in Daniel. And with all of his graphs and all of his things, he would go about teaching in these palaces of Europe. And he became quite well known. They considered him a little eccentric, but he was well known. And uh, then he got a calculation. Now, how he reached this calculation, I don't even see how he got it, but he got it. And he got it right. You know that God could get you to get things right when you really aren't so right, but he can get you to see it. So he he was studying, studying about the restoration of Israel, and he had these calculations that he worked through, and he came to the year 1897. And according to his calculations, that year, 1897, would mark the dawn of the final restoration of Israel in the Promised Land. Uh... In reaching that year, Heckler and his strange calculations were right. That year really marked the starting point of the ultimate restoration of Israel in the entire world. So he, 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 he went about, he preached it everywhere. He preached it to Jews. He preached it to all the leaders of Europe. He'd go to the Jews and he'd say, you are going to come back. He would tell them, God will, and, and they, they got a Zionist movement, some of the Jews, God will bless your movement. It will succeed even if you doubt him. And so he preached this everywhere. But as he saw uh, this coming about, he said, we need a Moses. God needs a Moses. When God brought up the children of Israel out of uh, Egypt, he had a Moses. And I see these Zionist people, they're beginning to believe that it's time for them to come back, but they need a leader. They need a Moses. So he was looking everywhere for this Moses, and here it was down to the very time. On a Saturday morning, March 9th, and I'm reading to you from a book that's part of our package, The Prince and the Prophet. While pondering about his sermon for the next day at the embassy chapel, by this time he's in Vienna, and he's the, chapel, he's the chaplain there in Vienna. He looked in, he's always going to bookstores. And he discovered a new book in the window of one of his favorite bookstores. And his heart skipped a beat. Der Judenstadt. 
the Jewish state. He came nearer, nearer and bent over the name of the author, which did not bring anything to mind or any association. The author's name was Theodore Herzl. And so he said, to the, how long has this book been in print? He said, well, it's just been published very recently on February 14th here in Vienna, to be exact. Three weeks late, I am, he said. This is the Moses. And this book has been published for three weeks, and I didn't know about it. I have got to find this Moses. And he said, well, you should know this man. He's a popular writer. He writes for the newspaper, Theodore Herzl. And then he remembered, oh, yes. And this man was the one who wrote about the Dreyfus trial. There was a, there was a trial of Captain Dreyfus. Some things were missing in the, in the uh, stolen in the French army. And they blamed a Jewish Captain Dreyfus. And they railroaded him in court. They had no real proof against him. And Theodore Herzl, who was very secular, was covering the trial. And he saw, even in this, in this Europe that he was a part of and wanted to be assimilated in, they were railroading this man simply because he was a Jew. And so he started noticing this hmm. anti-Semitism. And he... He was posing for a picture, a portrait. And suddenly he began to have visions of a Jewish state. And he wrote a book, What a Jewish State Would Be Like If They Went Back to Their Homeland. He, and we would have beautiful modern houses. We shall have possessions. And he started talking about the different things that they would have. The Exodus will be an ascent of, of these people. And as he wrote the book, uh, which came to him by inspiration. Herzl, in his short autobiography, wrote, I don't remember ever writing anything in such a state of exultation in my life, though he was a, 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 a reporter. I heard a noise of wings Wow! when I composed certain stanzas. I, I, I wrote each day to exhaustion. So he wrote this book about what a Jewish state would be. <coughs> Herzl, I mean, Heckler found the book. He said, this is the Moses. He read the book. I got to find him. So he goes to Herzl's house. Herzl was at his desk. A card was handed to him of an unknown visitor, a pastor by profession, no doubt a bore, who would ask him to support some charitable institution by lauding it to the skies in his newspaper. Or else he was, after a conversation, uh, after a conversion, and in that case, the conversion would be brief. Heckler entered the office. Herzl had no time to note the great nobility of his visitor's face, who began to speak immediately in an enthusiastic tone, being obviously moved. Dr. Herzl, I have been waiting for you four years. Four years I've been announcing you to princes, statesmen, and ecclesiastical dignitaries whom I've met. I have prepared the way for you. The hour has rung, and your idea will succeed. Consider me as being at your service, at the service of our cause. But, sir, who are you? Herzl interrupted. The British cler clergyman under emotion had failed to follow the most basic English custom. He hadn't introduced himself. This done, the two men got to know each other. The Grand Duke of Baton was soon evoked, as well as the work of Heckler. Your book is inspired, Dr. Herzl, in a way you yourself do not realize. And that's good. This is a sign of the very grace of God. For just like everybody else, including every Jew in this capital, you've forgotten your prophets. You don't give them credit anymore. But you belong to your people and your prophets. And this, combined with the suffering of Israel, will not let you rest. Like Moses in the past, it is your people's martyrdom, both in Russia and in the features of a French captain, which have now bringing you back to God and toward the forgotten Jerusalem. I tell you with that emotion that I will always repeat it. God is with you, and you will succeed, What come what may. Herzl did not answer, being inwardly moved. He knew himself to be far from the Bible and its prophets. Had he judged correctly, he would soon see, Heckler continued. Today is the 10th of March. We have no time to lose. We have to act, act, act this month. I'm on the best of terms with the Grand Duke of Baden, who, as you know, is the uncle of the Kaiser. I'm sending a letter right away announcing you. 
Well, long story short, and it is a long story, and it's all in this book. He was connected with the leadership of Europe. He was connected with the superpowers of the day. He was connected with the czars. He was connected with the sultan. And he took Theodore Herzl to all of them. And he said, God's going to bring the Jews home. And all we need is for you to support it. If you will support it from your places of power, then the Jews can go home and Europe will be blessed and all will be blessed. But they didn't receive it. They didn't receive the opportunity to bless Herzl. I mean, they traveled. They traveled on horseback. They went to Jerusalem. They went everywhere with this, with this preacher urging Herzl on. Herzl, finally, he did meet with the Jews, and he organized the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland, 19, 1897. And there they met for the very first time. And they organized this Zionist Congress and he said, and I'm going to read you what he said, because that's when they, a group of Jews, Zionists, met in a Congress, and they decided uh, to make their way home. And he wrote concerning their, and I've been in this great hall where they met. He wrote, at Basel, I founded the Jewish state, 1897. This is Herzl writing. If I said this out loud today, I would be greeted by universal laughter. But in five years, perhaps, and certainly in 50 years, everyone will perceive it. At Basel, I have created the abstraction which as such is imperceptible to the great majority. At bottom, with infinitesimal means, I gradually worked the people up into the atmosphere of a state and made them feel it as if this were its national assembly. In 50 years precisely, November 29, 1947, the United Nations voted that Israel would become a nation. Praise. Theodore Herzl was the one who organized that. He, he worked hard. He wore himself out and he died young. And when he died young, at his side was this prophet of God, this William Heckler, who lived to be a very long life. Wow. And I wanted to um, read you the story of um, Herzl. I don't know if I have it down here, but I can remember it if I don't have it. When he was a child, even though he was raised secular, he had bar mitzvah. And someone had given him a book about the King Messiah. The Jews call the Messiah the King Messiah. And he had read in his book that the King Messiah was going to come on a white donkey. So he had a dream one night. And in the dream, he saw the King Messiah on the white horse. And the King Messiah, now he's only 12 years old or 13. So the King Messiah comes and swoops him up in his arms. And he says to him, there's Moses over in the distance. And the King Messiah says to Moses, for this child I prayed. And uh, that was the words of Hannah over Samuel. So the King Messiah said to Moses, for this child I prayed. And then he said to Herzl, you're going to lead the Jewish people, something like this. Um, I'll, I'll give you the exact reading Monday. Uh, Tell them I'm coming soon and you're going to lead them. And he did. Wow. He was that Moses that Heckler saw. This and he himself awesome. had that dream that he was that Moses. Wow. So God works through people. That's right. And he, this was one of the beginning, beginning stages of Christians and Jews working together. And now it's happening more and more and more. And amazing and wondrous things are happening on this earth. I don't care if all the darkness that goes around, there's a great light. Amen. Glory to God. That's great, Billy. Billy and I are going to come right back, so don't go away. Don't miss these exciting meetings. Kenneth and Gloria Copeland will be in Langley, British Columbia for the Canada Victory Campaign, May 12th through 14th at the Langley Events Center. The Southwest Believers Convention will be held the 4th through 9th of July, 2011 at the Fort Worth Convention Center in Fort Worth, Texas with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland and their special guests. Join Kenneth Copeland for the Venezuela Victory Campaign in Maracaibo de Zulia, Venezuela, August 26th and 27th at the Sports Center, Pedro Elias Belisario Aponte. Kenneth Copeland and Dr. Stephen and Kelly Swisher invite you to the Behind the Mission Weekend in New Jersey, September 16th and 17th at the Meadowlands Exposition Center. Pastor Terry Pearsons will be at the Toronto Spirit-Led Prayer Conference, September 28th through 30th, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. 
For more information, go to kcm.org. Today is offering day. Billy and I want to pray over your finances. And I'm going to just share some of the highlights from 2 Corinthians 9. Remember this, verse 6. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. And he who sows generously, that blessing may come to someone, will also reap generously and with blessings. So we know that we reap according to how we sow. Let each one give as he's made up his own mind, purposed in his heart. This is the Amplified Brief Parts of the Amplified. For God loves, uh, he takes pleasure in, prizes above all, every, uh, all other things, is willing to abandon and do without a cheerful, prompt to do it, joyous giver whose heart is in his giving. Praise God. So when we sow and when we give, it's important that we listen to the Lord and that we do it with our heart. We do it with our heart. We say, oh, I got to give this. I'm going to give a whole dollar here. And it just hurts somebody to think about it. You know, no, that's not the way you sow. You sow knowing you're planting a crop. You're sowing so that you can reap. This is one of my favorite scriptures about money. And God is able. This was a great comfort to me when it didn't look like there was any way for Ken and me to prosper. And God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may always, you may always under all circumstances, whatever the need, to be self-sufficient. Furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. So you, you make up your mind. You get your offering ready. And Billy and I are going to pray right now over your finances. Father, we Father, lift up every, every person watching right now. And we ask Ooh, you, Lord, to help Lord. them in their finances. Look at their seed. They're it's sowing seed. It matters not how much the seed. It's our heart. It's our faith. Our heart is in our giving in Jesus' name. We break the power of poverty over your life in the name of Jesus. And we believe that Hallelujah. as you sow according to the word of God today, you will prosper and be blessed. Praise be blessed. Increase in Jesus' in name. Jesus name, hallelujah. Increase. Praise now, God. if you if you've got a situation in your finances and you you know you're you know you're not quite cutting it there, you go to the Word of God and you study the blessing scriptures. Hallelujah. The Word of God says that we are blessed. Hallelujah. And our giving Praise increases God. us. Hallelujah. If, you'd want, if you want to review any of these broadcasts, co go to our website, kcm.org. Go to a good church that preaches you the Word of God this weekend. Take your Bible. You need to go to a church where you need to have your Bible with you. That's right. Because somebody's preaching it. Join us again next week. This is Gloria and Billy reminding you that Jesus, Jesus is, is Lord, Lord. And He's coming soon. Yes. Thanks for joining us on the Believer's Voice of Victory. For this week's broadcasts on DVD or CD, today's product offer, or for more information on KCM, visit kcm.org. Online, you'll find free ministry resources to help you live every day in faith. Receive God's promise that everything is going to be all right.